What's up YouTube? What's going on guys? So today we're going to be talking about uh, foam rolling. We're going to talk about what the scientific evidence currently says about foam rolling, what we know from the scientific literature, and then we're also going to actually talk about my own anecdotes and experiences with foam rolling and what I think um, foam rolling can do for you and how to actually use it. There's really polarizing viewpoints on this topic. There's the K-Star fanatics who are like obsessed with foam rolling and they use pointy foam rollers, vibrating foam rollers, they do all the special cool mobility exercises and they think it's the greatest thing since the invention of the wheel. And then there's the evidence-based community um, who often I think look at the scientific literature and hate on foam rolling a little bit too much. Uh, and I'm going to give you my viewpoint, which is somewhere in the middle, more leaning towards the evidence-based side, but I do think foam rolling actually has some practical uses, especially for people doing loaded barbell movements. Um, so let's talk about foam rolling. I'm not going to do the super cool YouTube thing and post an abstract on the screen as I talk about all this. No one actually reads the scientific uh, literature that I'm posting on the screen. I realize that I've done it in my past videos. It's a cool new like YouTube thing to do. Um, if you guys actually want to look at the science, look at it yourself. I'm going to post a bunch of studies down in the description box below, a systematic review, um, a bunch of the studies that I'll be mentioning as we film this. So go take a look at the evidence yourself if you're curious. Otherwise, you can just hear me talk about it. So what do we know foam rolling does? What does the evidence say? The, the actual scientific literature is going to be this left side of the board. What do, we, what do we know it does? We know it causes transient changes beyond baseline mobility. What I mean by that is basically the foam roller we know for a fact can increase range of motion at your joints. It can increase your flexibility um, for a transient amount of time, meaning it is not permanent. We do not get permanent change from the foam roller. All of you probably already know this. You lay on the foam roller one day, you feel good, you get through your workout, the next day you're tight all over. So the foam roller itself, the release technique itself does not actually cause permanent change. And that's something people need to, to, to realize. Most of the literature out there already shows and states this. And you really could just know this yourself by laying on a foam roller or using a lacrosse ball or doing release techniques. You get tight again eventually anyway. So although it can't permanently change flexibility uh, or range of motion at the joints, it does have um, transient changes. And how those changes work is kind of argued. So the original concept, the original idea of how foam rolling or release uh, techniques, the cross rolling, all that stuff worked was that there was fascia restricting your muscle, um, which is a layer of, uh, it's like a sheeted layer over your muscle. And they thought that it would get stuck on the muscle and cause restriction. But this study done by Kadri et al., which is down in the description box, I forget what year it was done in, um, they showed that the amount of pressure you would need to change um, the actual physiological structures, and that's what I wrote down here, does not work through physiological structure change. Meaning, uh, this study actually showed the amount of pressure you need to do to change those physiological structures of the fascia and the muscle itself would be far more than you could ever even come close to applying with a foam roller uh, or a lacrosse ball or your hands digging into someone. There's no way to release your fascia or anything along those lines. And that study pretty much hands down proved that the the mechanism behind foam rolling, that the change we are experiencing is not physiological, it's probably neurological. Uh, meaning it's probably coming from something stemming from the neurolo neurological activity in your brain. So we know it doesn't work through physiological structural change. Now, um, what they do hypothesize is that it is perceptual change. This is kind of the leading hypothesis right now, that foam rolling can change your perception of how you feel. This is also uh, what they think stretching does. Uh, there's like an old 1994 study, I think it was 94, um, done on stretching, where uh, they concluded that, the researchers concluded that they believed the um, stretching or the effects of stretching came actually from perceptual change. We are more tolerant to this newfound range of motion we're in. And so it's not so much that the, the muscles are actually stretching themselves and getting broken down and stretching out. It's more we are tolerant to that. And I do believe that's the case for stretching. And I do believe that's the case for the kind of foam rolling and stuff we're talking about here. However, I think that falls a little short, and I think we need more evidence on this. If you actually look at the systematic review I posted, um, you'll see that the researchers, they compiled a bunch of different studies and looked at it. That's what a systematic review is. Uh, and they looked at all the evidence on foam rolling, and what they concluded was, although, yes, it does change range of motion uh, temporarily, and yes, it does um, seem to have some effects, um, they're not permanent, and there needs to be a lot more evidence explaining how this stuff works. Because if we don't understand how it works, we can't truly 
give any good insights on, on release techniques and foam rolling. So we need a lot more evidence to say how this stuff works. Now, what can we do until that evidence comes out? We can kind of rely on anecdote, and that's what I wrote up here. So I do think that evidence gives us some clues on how release can work, uh, and I'm going to show you, in a, or I'm going to tell you in a second how I believe you should implement it. But also, let's talk about anecdote. Um, I do actually think permanent change can happen from a foam roller release technique, and I think that can happen in extreme um, cases of dysfunction below your baseline. Now, what I mean by baseline when I say that here is it's kind of your baseline mobility. Basically, if you're a power lifter and you squat to depth every day, and you're doing it loaded, obviously, and you're going through these ranges of motion, that's kind of your baseline of mobility. That range of motion you hit daily is usually where, more or less, you can move in space with load on your back on any given day without having to warm up too rigorously. Um, for an Olympic lifter, they're going to have a higher baseline of mobility. Someone who's going into that overhead squat position daily, loaded, or doing a snatch or a clean and jerk, those are people who have a lot more uh, robust amount of mobility. Same thing with gymnasts. They have higher baselines of mobility than a power lifter. So you have to remember that your mobility um, baseline, like where you are most comfortable at on any given day, is pretty much going to be dependent on the stuff you're doing in the gym. And so you have like a baseline mobility, but every once in a while we go on a car ride for like eight hours and we get really knotted up traps or like we have some crazy workout or like volume block we went through and we're just like overly tight. Like we can't even move in normal space like how we normally can. And you might get like spasming knots in your traps. This is something my girlfriend was dealing with the other day. Her trap was so knotted up. It was kind of spasming as I was pushing on it. And there's this huge knot in here and her shoulder was elevated like this. Another one's down here. That's not normal. That's not a baseline uh, state of mobility. That's something that just caused that muscle to get hypertonic. And in that case, I dug my fingers in there, use a little bit of lacrosse ball, and that kind of releases that knot. And that knot never came back. So that change right there was permanent. Once we release that, and I've done this a thousand times on my personal training clients, on other people in the world, um, those kind of cases, that is permanent change. And while it would be awesome if we could look at scientific literature showing like in that kind of case that foam rolling or something could do that, there's none, no evidence on that, and there probably won't ever be because that would be a really weird thing to actually show in a study. But that's something that I don't need to study. And, and unfortunately, I think too much of the evidence-based community hates on stuff like that. Just because a study isn't showing it doesn't mean that it isn't happening. For instance, for years, I believed in spot reduction in a caloric deficit state. I used to get made fun of every time I said that. And now research is showing it's actually completely feasible and uh, spot reduction is a possibility in a caloric deficit. And so it just takes years sometimes for this research research to really come out. And in this case, I know for a fact permanent change can happen in extreme cases of dysfunction, but you're not going to achieve extra mobility beyond your baseline from laying on a piece of foam or like using a lacrosse ball. It's just this kind of a case where it can uh, happen. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is it's good for achieving proper activation and movement. What I mean by that is the other day, my TFL was really overactive and kind of like hyper tense and it was causing my left glute uh, to not fire properly. In fact, it's been like this for months. Now, the old the, or the train of thought on the evidence-based side is we don't need foam rolling per se. We can just get under a loaded barbell and that changes mobility better than like foam rolling can and just doing some basic activation drills and stuff. And I do believe that's true. However, in this case, if I have a muscle like my TFL, which is inhibiting proper glute activation on my left side and it's causing that hip shift in my squats, the only way I'm going to get into a better position if I go straight to the barbell or if I just do some activation stuff and then start lifting is if I can get that TFL to release somehow. And that's where I'm going to use that transient change from a lacrosse ball or a foam roller or something like that. I'm going to mash on that TFL, get it to relax a little bit. We don't really know what's happening. This is, again, would almost argue the perception change because I think it's a little bit beyond just perception. But I got my TFL to relax, and then my left glute started firing a lot harder. And we actually had filmed it. I'm going to see if I can find the videos and splice it in here. My uh, squat went from looking really shifty and like uh, off to my right side to very centered. And that was because in between sets, I was using that lacrosse ball to mash on that TFL and then I was doing some activation work on my left glute and it got everything centered in my pelvis and both of my glutes were then firing. That wouldn't have been achievable without getting that TFL released. So this idea 
that the transient change of foam rolling or lacrosse rolling or whatever would be useless is short-sighted. There's tons of cases you could do this, and I do this all the time with my own clients. I have them work on muscles that are hypertonic, meaning tense, overly tense, and then their other muscles that are underactive, that's the stuff I'm doing the stability work and the strengthening work and the uh, activation work on to get that firing properly. Now, the end goal is we don't really want to touch the foam roller or the cross ball roller more than we need to. Um, someone who's like an Olympic lifter, they're going through such high uh, states of flexibility on a daily basis loaded, they're probably very rarely going to ever need a foam roller. But someone like a power lifter who isn't doing that as often, and we, we train in a different way where we're getting tight via, um, like going to muscular failure often, there's a higher neurological demand with powerlifting, there's a higher physiological demand with powerlifting, it can cause a lot of wacky crap to happen in your body. And there's there are times where we can utilize a foam roller or a lacrosse ball to fix that, just kind of how I stated. So I, I don't like this polarized viewpoint where it's the foam roller is the best thing ever, or the foam roller is the most useful, uh, useless thing ever. I think it's somewhere in the middle. I think it has a purpose, but it is a tool. I think people like Kelly Sturett, and I have no problem saying this, I think he's literally sold himself on the idea of foam rolling, bandage stretches. Like, he, he knows better. Like, the, some of the stuff he says is so against what the current research states, and I know he knows better, but he does it because it's a selling point and it sounds really cool to people. And so I don't want people to get caught up in this idea that foam rolling or these special mobility drills are the best thing ever, but I also don't want you guys to get caught up and think um, when people like Quinn Hennock kind of mention, hey, foam rolling isn't the coolest thing around, I, it, he's not saying it's useless. And I actually know Quinn on a personal level and he stated this to me before. So rely somewhere in the middle, let me know what you guys thought. Let me know if you have any questions about this stuff in the comment section below. Um, foam rolling can have its place, but it's not the best thing ever. Give me a thumbs up if you watch this whole thing. Uh, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you guys next time.